If you'll turn in your copies of God's Word to 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 3. The title of the message tonight, by the way, is called Proper Behavior. Proper Behavior. I think you all can guess the uh, writer of this book is the Apostle Peter, and the author, of course, is God the Holy Spirit. And this is often called the Epistle of Hope because it uses prominent words like hope, joy, rejoicing, and glory. And if you'll turn back to chapter 1, we see, again, from Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, and who, he, who the epistle is written to, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. So we know this is, it says strangers, but we know these are saved folks because, in verse 2, he says, elect according to the foreknowledge of God. In verse 2, Three, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So he's talking again to believers in verse 9. Receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. So this is written for, to believers. And those of us who are believers here tonight, this is a very, very practical message for us. Nothing real deep, but it, it can be really deep. Because when we really look at ourselves in the mirror of God's word... In chapter 2, a little breakdown of that, that speaks about the duties of Christians in society. He talks about uh, different things in society. He talks about employers. He talks about servants or employees. So he deals with that, chapter 2, all the way to verse 25. And then in chapter 3, it's divided in the first seven verses. talks about, gives instructions to wives and then the husbands. And then we get to verse 8, and it deals with behavior or duties of Christians within the church. And that's you and me here tonight. And that's what we're going to talk about. The passage will be 1 Peter chapter 3, and we're going to be looking at verses 8 through 11. Now, I'll tell you ahead of time that there's going to be 12 points to the message tonight. You're like, well, hey, we'll be good. But there's 12 points for us to consider here in these verses, and, and they, we'll just go right through them, and we'll do some self-evaluation, because that's what we, we do every time we open God's Word, for Him to show us, us. Now, he also talks about some being. He uses the word be. So that's a, an evaluation of something that we need to put into practice in our lives. And it doesn't say, if you want to be this, or if you want to be that. It strictly says be, and we'll look at some of those things. And he also, he doesn't necessarily use the word do, but he's looking at for some actions in our lives as well. Thus the title, Proper Behavior. So I'm going to begin reading in verse 8, and we'll go down to verse number 11. Finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous, not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrarywise, blessing. Knowing that ye are thereunto called, that ye should inherit a blessing. For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. Let him eschew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we have here before us your word open uh, in our laps, in our hands, however the case may be. Lord, you want our hearts to be open to receive your word tonight as well. We pray that we will be listening and we will be hearers so that we may be doers. And Lord, we would be as you would tell us to be within this passage of scripture and all through your word. That Lord, we would be, as the song said, oh, to be like thee, Lord. And we pray that, Lord, you would bless our time here tonight in your word. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Verse 8 says, finally be ye of all one mind. So he's given instruction all through chapter 1 and chapter 2, again in society, and then in the family. Then he gets in the church and he uses that word finally. So we need to consider what was there before, as I mentioned. And then he gets into our behavior as individuals in the church and collectively. First thing he says is be all of one mind. In Philippians chapter 2, you can read verse 1 through 18, and in verse 5, the Apostle Paul writes to that church there, he says, Let this mind be you in, 
uh, be in you, which also was in Christ Jesus. So we're to have the mind of Christ. If everyone here tonight has the mind of Christ, we will be like-minded. We will have one mind. Now that doesn't mean take my brain out and I get yours, you get mine. Believe me, you don't want mine. I may want some of yours. But no, it's thinking alike. Uh, we're all going in one direction. And how do we know what direction that is? Right here. We're all following, purposing to follow the mind of Christ. Now in that, some practical questions and thoughts in that. Do you surround yourself with like-minded people? Now as believers, that's who we need to be surrounding ourselves with. Uh, if you're hanging around all the time with unbelievers... You don't want to be like-minded with them. Uh, <clears throat> so we, to be like-minded, need to all be seeking to honor God uh, and not ourselves. And we need to mind the same things. We know what the Great Commission is, right, for our church. We should all be on board with that. We should all be striving for that. I was thinking recently of a, a message Pastor Geis was preaching on unity. That's exactly it. Unified in our thoughts and in our minds and in our purpose. Believers in the Lord ought to be united in a common outlook and a common interest. The character of a man or a woman is determined and revealed by the things that we give to our mind. Things that flow out of our mouths, things that show up in our lives, they start in our minds. So we need to all be like-minded. If our minds are controlled by God's Word, really God's Spirit, then there will be great unity for every one of us and we will be like minded, all of one mind. It doesn't say most, it says all. The next he says is having compassion. But before I get to that, let me say a little bit more on that. To be like minded, I don't need to try to be you. Please don't try to be me. One loy is enough, okay? But I'm not to try to be you in that area of being like mindedness as far as. We all need to be thinking alike, but you think differently than I do. We should, we should not be comparing one with another. And I had, uh, whenever I uh, had a tour with, uh, in a squadron, there was one skipper, very charismatic, very outgoing. He, he was on, they're all on the ball if they're a skipper. But anyway, he had this charismatic character and everybody loved. He was a natural leader. So it came time for him to pass the torch to the next guy. And the next guy that I work with, he came to me and said, how do I be him? Because we're so successful, I said. And he talked about these different things. He was comparing himself to the previous guy. And my answer to him is, you be you. He did him well, you won't do him well. <clears throat> I can't do you well. If I tried to do you, we're never going to be like-minded, okay? I need to do me, you need to do you, and we all pull together in like-mindedness. So we need to be united in Christ in every aspect of our lives. <clears throat> we should all have one aim and one purpose, and we should all be going in the same direction. Now back to compassion I mentioned. Compassion one of another. That's one of another. That's a, that's a two-way thing. It's not to one, it's one of another. So that means there's an interchange of fellow feeling of joy, which that happens among us, and also sorrow. Luke 10, 33 says, if you're familiar with Luke 10, remember the Good Samaritan, that, I, I don't like to use the word story, but that account that happened, and, uh, and how many people passed by and showed no compassion? But it was the Samaritan, the ones that people would not have suspected to do that is the one that showed compassion on him. Every believer should have compassion for one another. And there are words that come to mind when I think about this. And when you're thinking about compassion is when a person's going through issues in their life where they're having a hard time or, or uh, illness. I mean, there's so many things we could list, but we're not going to do that. But there are different responses regarding compassion that we see. First, there are the ones that are empathetic. 
The ability to understand and share the feelings of another. In other words, you can put yourself in the other person's shoes. You ever think about that? <clears throat> I was thinking about Brother Bottom earlier this week of him laying in a hospital bed. And I thought, I can pray for him better if I put myself in his situation. How many things is he missing out on? He has a dear wife at home. He mentioned the food and things like that, but... I would much rather be home. It made me thankful for how I am health-wise, but I had empathy for Brother Bottom in that situation. So to put yourself in their shoes, that's being compassionate. Sympathetic is feelings of pity or sorrow for someone else's misfortune or situation. But many times, even within the church, what happens instead of sympathy and empathy is apathy. You know what the apathy is? I'm not going to be bothered with them. I don't care. Uh, let's see. Lack of interest or not enthusiastic. I have no concern for that other person, what they're going through. Can Christians get like that? Absolutely. That is not being compassionate. We are to be empathetic and sympathetic. The word Peter here used imply the idea of sympathy. Basically, he was, we should suffer together. That don't mean I want to be in the same hospital bed right next to Brother Bottom, but I can suffer with him and relate with him to better help minister to him and to show compassion. If one is selfish, which a lot of people are these days, and we can tend to be often, it's difficult to demonstrate genuine sympathy uh, toward even a brother in Christ. Here's how I look at it. Selfishness stifles compassion. Selfishness stifles compassion. So that's compassion. He says here, having compassion, that having, that means possessing, exhibiting, practicing compassion one of another. And he says then, he says, love as brethren. <clears throat> brethren, we are brothers and sisters in Christ. Because if you have God as your heavenly Father, then we are brothers and sisters. How did you get along with your brothers and sisters growing up? If you had siblings, I was a middle child. I had an older brother, a sister my age, and a sister that was a lot younger. Did we always get along? No. <clears throat> we didn't. Uh, but no matter what, I've always had a love for my brothers and sisters. Even when they did me wrong, I did them wrong or whatever, I always love my brothers and sisters, and I love my brothers and sisters in God's family. But let someone else come mess with my brother or my sister, hey, game on, okay? See the attitude there? Love of the brethren. Love as brethren. <clears throat> the next, he says, compassion one of another. Love as brethren. Be pitiful. Now, that doesn't mean... Sit alone in the floor somewhere and look all downtrodden. That's not what this is talking about. Believers should be pitiful. Another word for that is tender-hearted or affectionately sensitive. We see an example of that in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32. And be kind one to another. And right after that, he says, tender-hearted, forgiving one another. And then he qualifies that. Even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. Think about that. God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. Tell me God is not tender-hearted toward you and I. That tender-heartedness is what led to His forgiveness of us. <clears throat> By the way, that, that portion in Ephesians and in this scripture is the only places in scripture where we use that word pitiful means tender-heartedness. So Christians should always express more affection to each other. <clears throat> But many have lost concern for others, even within the church today. Because I'm busy living my life and dealing with my own issues. I don't have time to worry about others. Well, we need to be pitiful. We need to take time to worry, not worry in the sense, but to uh, <clears throat> be compassionate and tenderhearted toward others. Then he uses a word, he says, love his brother and be pitiful and be courteous. Be courteous. Does that mean I say... Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Okay, I'm going to hold the door for my wife. I'm courteous. Well, this means friendly or 
to with friendly thoughtfulness. <clears throat> it means to be humble-minded. And humility is really a biblical virtue that is lost even in among a lot of churches today. <clears throat> it's a picture of oneself as being weak, dependent, and a finite creature. When one truly measures himself against the perfect standard, which is God's word and, and God and his holiness, that's when we get the proper response, which is humility, to see where we stand before God. <clears throat> now he says, be pitiful, be courteous. And he says in that, not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing. <clears throat> Giving evil for evil or railing for railing. To rail means to scold or to, uh, <clears throat> to reproach with anger. It's really to retaliate. <clears throat> But the opposite thing of that is to be courteous. To retaliate, that's not the biblical answer. Instead, the believer should give back blessing. And that gives us right into the next word. He says, not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrarywise. And that contrarywise means uh, from over against. In other words, it's opposite to, which is rendering evil for evil or railing for railings, to blessing. Romans 12, verses 9 to 21, you can read that. Those are the marks of a true Christian. And in verse number 14 of that passage, the Bible says, Bless them which persecute you, bless and curse not. So blessing others and wishing them well is one thing, but those that persecute you and those that do you wrong, are we to do that? It's easy when people are being nice to you, is it not? What about when they're persecuting you? Uh, it's not easy. Now, to bless means to speak well of or to praise uh, actions or, or things like that, <clears throat> to celebrate with praise. And there's a lot more we can, we can talk about that. But we're going to go on. Uh, <clears throat> in verse 90, uh, he says, But contrary wise blessing, knowing that ye are thereunto called, that ye should inherit a blessing. Then he says, for he that will love life and see good days. So he tells us to love life. Love can be known from the actions that it prompts. How do I know that I love life? How does my wife know that I love her? I can tell her all day long, but if I never show it, if I, if I never show it and do things for her, then it's just empty words. <clears throat> you know, God loves us. And he didn't just tell us that. He, sent his, he did something about it. He took action. He sent Jesus Christ to die for you and me. So God's love is seen through the gift of his son. Christian love has God for its primary object and expresses itself, first of all, by us obedient, obeying God's word. Now, all of us have a self-will, and all of us like doing things called self-pleasing. Self-pleasing, but self-pleasure negates love of others. <clears throat> and to love life, we are to have a deep and constant love, by the way. That deep and constant love does three things. It produces and fosters a reverential love for God and also practical love toward each other, other believers, and a desire to help others know God or come to know God. So, to love life is to love God and to love brothers and sisters and to have a desire for others to come to know God. He also says, for he that will love life and see good days. How many of us like good days? How many of us like bad days? We need both, don't we? But he says here, he says, and see good days. Good days. We've all seen good days. We've all seen bad days. Hopefully the good outweighs the bad. But this is, uh, <clears throat> uh, how do you judge your day to whether or not it's a good day or a bad day? <clears throat> to me, it's a good day when I roll over, I hear the alarm, and I have a pulse in my body. That's a good day because that's a gift from God. But what about when you have a bad day? It's easy whenever you get to the blessings that we're talking about. Inheriting a blessing and, and contrary-wise blessing, it's easy to feel blessed and to bless other people when you're having a good day, isn't it? 
Well, can't you do that when you're having a bad day? Because if you do that when you're having a bad day, that turns into a good day. But that's hard, isn't it? Just like loving those uh, that <clears throat> persecute you. We can have good days even when it is a bad day. Now, do you look at your bad days as uh, the optimist or pessimist? The pessimist glasses have empty, I'm having an awful day. Or do you, are you an optimist? I'm going to have a rough morning, but I know the Lord's going to give me such and such, whatever. So look for the positive for the rest of the day and how the Lord will bless your life and give you an opportunity to bless others. I guarantee you whatever bad day you think you're having, somebody's having a worse day. Even in knowing that. Now, that don't mean you're going to say, Lord, I'm glad I'm not so-and-so and what they're going through. No. But what you do is you get your eyes off your bad day and focus on so-and-so and pray for them. Guess what that makes you? Have a good day. So we're to have good days. By the way, who controls whether or not you have a good day or not? <clears throat> do I control whether you have a good day or not? Well, I can have input in that. Maybe I do you wrong. Maybe I say something that you didn't like. Or others may do or say something that affects you. But you control your out, the outcome, whether it's a good day or not. I can control whether or not my wife has a good day or not. <clears throat> I have a direct impact on that, but she's the one that's really going to choose whether or not she has a good day or a bad day. We choose our good days and bad days. I think we need to choose good days, no matter what happens. <clears throat> he says also, he says, For he that will love life and see good days, <clears throat> let him refrain his tongue from evil. In his lips that they speak no guile. To refrain your tongue. The book of James is great about talking about our tongue. Uh, and how that a fountain can spew sweet and bitter. Hey, that defines our tongue. That's in James chapter 3, by the way. But we should have lips that speak no guile. You know what guile is? Guile is crafty, tricky words and they're used to decoy or in order to deceive someone else it's really for the purposes of your own self now there's the bible uses terms wiles or doing something wilily that's the same instance but that's in actions uh, <clears throat> physical things but guile is that essence in words and he says he says, and his lips that speak no guile. So we shouldn't have those crafty, tricky words. Okay? Psalm 34, verse 13. If I go to Psalm 34, parallels a lot of what uh, Peter says here. He says in Psalm 34, verse 11, Come ye children, hearken unto me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. That fear is that reverence. What man is he that desireth life and loveth many days that he may see good? That's a question he asks. What man is he that desireth life and loveth many days that he may see good? And then he says, Keep thy tongue from evil and thy lips from speaking guile. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. Those are the same things that he's talking about here in the book of 1 Peter. <clears throat> so we're to keep thy tongue from evil and thy lips from speaking guile. Such a tongue will not produce good fruit in your life or the kind of life that the psalmist was talking about. And again, we're talking about proper behavior in the context here. <clears throat> so your tongue, things you say, do they label you as a Christian? Because we use that term, I think, too many times, likely even within uh, churches, oh, I'm a Christian. Well, that means Christ-like. So if you really evaluate your tongue and words you say, are they words that Jesus Christ would say? Would they be words if you had a red letter edition or you have a Bible? Our Bible has direct quotes direct from Jesus Christ that he spoke. Would what you speak, would it come out of his mouth? If not, he uses that word, if it should not, he uses that word refrain, mm -hmm. hold off, refrain. 
And he says in verse 22 uh, of, of uh, Psalm 34, he says that no guile should be found in his mouth. <clears throat> so back to 1 Peter chapter 3, he says in his lips that speak no guile in verse 10. In verse 11 he says, let him eschew evil. To eschew means to avoid or get out of the way of. See, we are to avoid evil. Again, he says the same thing that I read in Psalm 34, uh, verses 12 to 16. Wrong deeds are usually the product of planning and deliberate choice. Now, I'm talking about evil deeds, really any wrong deed. No one accidentally does evil. You don't accidentally sin. I don't accidentally sin. It's a clear, conscious choice. And he's telling us to avoid, get out of the way of that behavior. Psalm 37 is very direct. Depart from evil and do good and dwell forevermore. So that's very direct. Depart from evil. Instead of planning to do evil, the individual must plan to do that which is right or good. Simply stated, let him uh, eschew evil and do good. What does it mean to do good? First off, he doesn't give us an option. Eschew evil, and then if you want to, do good instead. It's a given that we are to do good. <clears throat> to do means mandatory. Something that automatically happens. And good, what is good? Well, <clears throat> a lot of people may define that different way. I look at it like this. It's the best. It's whatever is better. It's whatever is fair. It is whatever is fine. That is what's good. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 31 says, Whether for ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all for the glory of God. So he says, do good. If you do everything that you do to the glory of God, not to the glory of self, it will be good. Because you're doing it for the right person, for the right reason. To do good. Good. <clears throat> to do good. So do you show the goodness of God? <clears throat> and last of all, he says in verse number 11, Let him eschew evil and do good. Let him seek peace <clears throat> and ensue it. To seek peace. To ensue means to grab something as if it may escape. Have you ever held a little insect in your hand? Maybe an ant, maybe a real tiny insect, not a bee, because they would hurt, but some kind of insect, right? How do you stop them from escaping? You, you have it clenched so tight, and you don't want any areas open. Well, that's how we're to be with peace. We are to seek it, and we, tar, we are to ensue it, which is to keep it just that way. If you want to control your tongue, as we're talking about, if you want to turn from evil and do what's what's good, if you want to actively seek peace, you will not give evil for, or evil or railing for railing. Your thoughts will be oriented differently because you are seeking peace. <clears throat> Romans 12 verse 18 says, If it be possible and as much as lieth in you, I will tell you this, it is possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Wait, even someone that would persecute me, even someone that I really bump heads with? Yes. <clears throat> yes. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14 begins, says, Follow peace with all men in holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. So he says, follow peace with all men. <clears throat> Peter reminds us that the Lord God is aware of all that takes place in the life of a believer. No matter what happens in our life, we are to seek peace and ensue it. <clears throat> he also sets his face against evildoers and his punishment will fall upon them. God does that. That's not for us to do that. <clears throat> God has not committed judgment of others to us. We're to seek peace and let God deal with them. So... <clears throat> You know, I used to uh, 
I guess, quippedly, if that's a word or whatever. My parents used to tell me, you probably heard this whenever you're growing up, uh, <coughs> to behave, right? To behave. And my question was always, what is have? What is have? Do you know how many ter- times th- God uses the word be in his word? And we only touched just a few of those tonight in this passage of scripture to be this and to be that. And he is very clear in what he says for us to be. And for us to be those things is because we have the proper behavior. And what do we have as the ultimate example of that is Jesus Christ himself. Is Jesus Christ himself. He was God in the flesh. So we are to be of one mind. We are to be compassionate. And then we also have some doing in there, to love his brethren, to be pitiful, to be courteous. <clears throat> Again, doing, he wants us to bless others, whether we're being blessed or not, to love life, to see good days, to refrain our tongue, to eschew evil, to do good, and to seek peace. Now, there are so many passages I was reading in First. Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians this morning in my Bible reading. And every time those words be or if he uses the word do are so prevalent within God's word. None of those are qualified by the ifs that we put before that. They're just stated in God's word to be this way or to do this or to do that. So the question for all of us here tonight is, what's going to be your behavior when you see those things in God's Word? We see, we're talking about, whose behavior is he talking about here? Remember, the context of the passage is here is we as a church, collectively. <clears throat> and for each one of us that's uh, here, individually, God is concerned and he wants our behavior to be correct. 